I can't tell you how joyous it is to hear God's people singing his praises. Uh, really, it's my favorite thing in the world. In fact, we went to Chick-fil-A, which uh, the Lord's Chicken, on what day? We go every day. But uh, we went on Friday, Thursday, Thursday. Uh, they all run together these days. Uh, and we were listening to my worship playlist, and we were listening to a song called All Glory Be to Christ, which is an old hymn that they, uh, that Bob Coughlin and Sovereign Grace Music kind of renditioned toward uh, the melody of Old Lang Syne, you know, the, the, the song we sing New Year's Eve. It's a beautiful, beautiful song, but it's, I think it's at the Together for the Gospel conference that they did. And the recording is just a lot of Men in ministry singing. It's a live recording and you just hear the people of God singing, all glory be to Christ our King. And I just told my wife, I said, you know what, really, in all honesty, I can't help but to, but to have some sort of emotional pull towards hearing people sing gospel praises. And the reason is, is because it's just a glimpse into what heaven is going to be like, right? This is our lot. We will be singing all glory be to Christ for all of eternity. That's one of my favorite things to look forward to about heaven. And then Penny started losing her mind and screaming and crying. I said, that's another good thing about heaven is there won't be any more of that. That'll be great too as well. So uh, church, if you have your copy of God's word, would you turn with me to Psalm 36? As we start a new series this morning, uh, which is not something we do often, but uh, this is gonna be our summer series entitled Joy Seeker. We're going to be all over the place, uh, really, this morning, but our base text will be from Psalm 36, verses 5 through 10. If you know me and you've been here quite often, preaching a topical series is not something I'm necessarily comfortable with, and yet I think um, the Lord has directed my heart particularly towards this topic, um, and you'll see why, I hope, as we walk through this text together. So if you're able, would you join me in standing for the reading of God's Word? We'll be reading Psalm 36, verses 5 and 10 again this morning. Psalm 36, 5 through 10. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep, O Lord. You preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. First Baptist Church of Grey Gables, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Let's go to the Lord and thank him for his word. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we taste and see the sweetness of your holy throne of grace. We come into your presence and we pray that these things that we read today might be grasp by our souls that we would indeed treasure them, that we might know the flowing pleasures from your throne in our lives forevermore. We pray that you would give us joy in the Lord for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, go ahead and, and be seated and then we'll jump right in. Happiness is the great question of human life. The great issue that continually confronts mankind. The world longs for happiness, but they usually don't find it, do they? Now listen, we can't help but to long for happiness because we've been created in the image of an eternally happy God. And so if the great human longing is happiness, then the great tragedy of, of mankind and the history of the world is people seeking happiness where they will never be able to find it. People settling for a form of happiness that is fleeting, that is wicked, and far less than satisfying. In fact, I was reminded of a lot of quotes by C.S. Lewis this week, but one of this famous C.S. Lewis, Lewis quotes where he put it this way, he said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures 
fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. I think the great tragedy of our existence is that you and I are far too easily pleased. That, that you and I do not seek pleasure with the resolve and passion that we should. That we settle for the mud pies of human existence rather than the infinite delight that is offered to us in the gospel of God and the word of God. Particularly here in Psalm 36 as we read... In fact, I would argue that the Bible commands that we ought to seek the supreme and perfect happiness. Because ultimately, supreme and perfect happiness is only found in one place, namely in God himself. Amen. This will be the subject of our little summer series. And following the normal pattern again, we'll, after doing a line-by-line -line series through a book, we'll be doing a topical series in between that. Our theme in this topical series is becoming a joy seeker, joy of the Lord. And the outline of this is based loosely on the classic book, Desiring God by John Piper. And as I always do with every author, just because I mention that author's name does not mean I align myself with every bit of his doctrinal teaching. And yet, I consider that book, Desiring God, to be a classic so I would encourage you, if you don't have it, to grab it. It's available online even. I hope it'll be a help to you. But as always, it's not necessary because I'll be deviating immensely from the book, really just taking the outline and structure. My prayer is, really, at all in the midst of this summer series, that the Lord would restore our joy as Christians, particularly in this day and age. I feel like often we become a joyless people, and that is not reflecting our Lord, as we'll see today. So today what I'd like to do is cover the introduction of Christian joy, the foundation of Christian joy, through examining that title, Desiring God. The subtitles of that book is Meditations from a Christian Hedonist. We'll be using the title Joy Seeker, not Christian Hedonist, but John Piper would define himself as a Christian hedonist. And if you don't know what hedonism is, hedonism is the philosophy of living your life for your own pleasure. Living for your own happiness. Now obviously the word hedonism, the philosophy of hedonism has a very negative connotation to it, doesn't it? In fact, when John Piper first mentioned the idea of Christian hedonism to his own congregation, a parent came up to him at the end of the service and said, Dr. Piper, did you know that my little girl thought you said Christian heathenism? See, even if you pronounce it correctly, hedonism sounds a lot like heathenism. That is to say, what is destroying our society, our homes, our schools, our business, but this reckless, modern, worldly pursuit of pleasure? Of course, this is not nearly a modern phenomenon. Of course, in 2 Timothy, Paul warned that men would be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God in such days. So if you react just against that word hedonism or even just against the word of being a joy seeker, I could not agree with you more. Our homes, our schools, our businesses, our societies are being destroyed by hedonistic pleasure seekers who have cast off morality, truth, and self-denial. So what could possibly this man mean by using the word Christian in front of the idea or philosophy of hedonism? Isn't that a contradiction of terms? Well, I want to start with some biblical examples of really what he's trying to get at. You see, David describes the supreme source of happiness in the psalm before us in verses 7 and 8. David says, How precious is your loving kindness, O God! Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures." This, he says, is the source of all true delight, goodness, and satisfaction in the world. So therefore, David counsels, or even commands that you become a joy seeker. When he says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart, that famous verse we know, he's 
commanding you to seek joy. The sons of Korah also in Psalm 42, 1 through 2 command this as well. They illustrate this and give this a picture as they say, as the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. This response is nothing more than a flowing stream of pleasure from God. That our thirst for him finds its counterpart or its answer in him. I believe Moses was a joy seeker in the sense of Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, where the Bible tells us about him in the Hall of Fame of Faith, saying, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. See, that is to say, even the worst thing that Christ gives us is better than the best things the world can give. So Moses is refusing temporary wicked pleasures in order to obtain eternal, infinite, holy, and fully satisfying pleasures found in Christ alone. So even as Christ, we learn in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, had to go through the greatest of trials, the Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, not only was, was all of their joy ahead of them, but the Lord, even in his suffering, says, I delight to do your will, O God. Even if it involves pain, self-denial, discomfort, yet Jesus says it is better to do God's will than not. It is my food and drink to do the will of my Father. It is life itself, even though it may lead us to the valley of the shadow of death. So we must understand, and we do understand, that often there is pain and loss associated with becoming a joy seeker. But the point is... And seeking our joy in Christ, we gain so much more. We've got a far greater possession and an abiding one in him. So again, stop me if you've heard this one before. Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Listen, that selling all that he has, that involves loss, sorrow, pain, but of course, the, the point of that small parable is what you're receiving is so much greater than what you might be losing. He must sell all, that is true, but he can do so for joy because of what he's receiving. And so this, if this definition is, is true, if this is the lot of Christians that we ought to be seeking joy that is found in an all-satisfying God, then how would we define sin? If that's true, what is sin? Sin, therefore, would be when a fleeting, lesser, wicked pleasure at the moment is more desirable to us than the eternal, infinite, pure pleasures that God delights to give us. It's having our hearts set on the wrong thing and following after that thing. So, so you could say that the process even of sanctification, our growth and holiness, all of Christian growth is among other things, learning to seek the highest joys and the fullest pleasures. See, our desire to be happy is a God-given desire and should not be denied or resisted, but instead should be directed toward God to find its fullness and satisfaction. See, if you abandon the pursuit of joy... You therefore cannot fulfill the will of God. Christians, hear me. You must pursue joy. And often, isn't it the case that what we've done in worship, what we've done in the Christian life, is made much of this simply burden and responsibility and neglected the engagement of joy? Let me ask you, was it for your joy that you came here this morning? Was it for your joy that you opened your Bible and read this week? Was it for your joy that you entered into prayer with a happy God this week? Is it for your joy when you encountered suffering and endured this week? You see how we get this backwards? 
We've missed this. And so what I want to do and what I've given you in your notes and in your outline this morning is really uh, the five theses from that book, Desiring God. Uh, You see them in your notes. Uh, What I want you to do is I'm not going to go through these. These are not the points of your outline. I just want to give you these so that you can meditate over these truths this summer. When somebody asks you, what's that Joy Seeker series about? These five theses are where you're going to go to find that answer. So I'm going to read through all five of these and, and see how he lays out his argument. Argument that becoming a Christian and being a Christian is simultaneous with becoming a joy seeker. Number one, the longing to be happy is a universal human experience and it is good, not sinful. Of course, he knows it becomes sinful when it's misdirected and not given to where it's supposed to. Number two, we should never try to deny or resist our longing to be happy as though it were a bad impulse. Instead, we should seek to intensify this longing and nourish it with whatever will provide the deepest and most enduring satisfaction. And spoiler alert, that's not going to be the things of this world. It's going to be the Lord. Third, the deepest, he says, and most enduring happiness is found only in God. Not from God and what he can give in material blessings, but in God and who he is. Fourth, the happiness we find in God reaches its consummation when it is shared with others in the manifold ways of love. And fifth, to the extent that we try to abandon the pursuit of our own pleasure, we fail to honor God and love people. Or to put it positively, the pursuit of pleasure is a necessary part of all worship and virtue. That is, the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. See, here's the issue, and here's where this sermon was really born out of. Our problem is too often we think that glorifying God is over here. It's going to take us this way. And that happiness is going to take us that way. So there's always this tension between should I glorify God or should I do what makes me happy? What he's reminding us is the Bible's view is that happiness, joy, pleasure, delight, satisfaction is found in the same direction as glorifying God. Those two are are the same thing. Different aspects, different ways of viewing the same thing. And it's just remarkable from the Psalms to Philippians to the book of Revelation how many references there are in the Bible to joy, happiness, pleasure, and exaltation. Those are the kind of things we're going to seek to cultivate throughout this series. These things that are said to be the inevitable fruit of a true living faith in the living God. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Let's not be completely out of balance There is a great deal of solemnity in the Bible. We know there's a great deal of misery in God's judgment, even for the life of believers. But in the midst of this, the point is, there always remains this brightness, this happy delight and active rejoicing because we know that God is greater than all. And so in the Psalms, there's this wrestling often, why are you cast down, O my soul? Right? Hope in God. Pointing back to the source of hope, the source of joy, the source of happiness in the moment of sorrow. God is greater than all. We know that our sins are forgiven for those of us who are in Christ. And and so much of that points us back to joy. And so rightly, the Bible calls us to worship in joy. And it's not hard for us to understand, it shouldn't be hard for us to understand why being a citizen of the kingdom of the Son of God ought to make us very happy people. Because despite all the circumstances, despite all the trials, despite everything else you could stack up on one side, there's a far bigger stack on the other. As Brother Corey read, I love this story that we just read in 1 Kings, right? Uh, When the Queen of Sheba, she went to visit Solomon's court. You remember what happened? She was awestruck. How happy are your men and and how happy are your servants? As a ruler, she realized what a tremendous privilege it is to have Solomon for one's king. And she rightly assumed that the people should just be pinching themselves. That this is not a dream that they do live for such a wonderful king and for such a wonderful kingdom. I read that and surely this is an invitation for us to consider our own life, happiness, and privileges. See, we are citizens and family members of the King of Kings. 
if the queen of Sheba could see if the people had Solomon as their king, they could not help but to be very happy people. Surely a greater king than Solomon is ours. When we're not happy, therefore it must be because we've largely forgotten our king in the kingdom in which we have an extraordinary privilege to be members. So, so we must therefore lay hold of happiness and pursue happiness. To trace out the heart and thought of the psalmist which continually goes from misery, starts in misery, and ultimately leads to praise. We do this by applying our faith to our circumstances. Taking hold of what is in fact actually ours, as we talked about in 1 Thessalonians, simply becoming what you are in Christ. To, like the queen of Sheba, make others sit up and take notice of the fact that we are happy servants of Christ. Loving happiness as people do in this world. There is nothing that perhaps could make them sit up and take notice than holding up happiness. I mean, look, the queen of Sheba, she saw the king and she could therefore conclude the happiness of the people. The people of the world can, can certainly work with the same solution backwards Seeing the happiness of the people to understand the greatness of the king that has made them so. See, our responsibility is not only to put on that happiness that is ours in Christ, but to manifest it. To live it. To help others to find it as well. We, of all people, should not be those who mope around in the world like all other human beings who are looking for happiness in all the wrong places. Encouraging others to do the same. We have supreme happiness ourselves. And therefore, it is our calling to lead others to it as well. And look, this idea is very practical. It really is. So let's put it into practicality. Husbands. Christian husbands, I'll say. Are your Christian wives happy? A simple way to evaluate your life as a Christian husband... Have you been your wife's helper to joy? In particular, have you so ordered your marriage in the Lord Jesus that joy has not only been your lot, but even more your wife's? Christian wives whose husbands are godly men, who love them as Christ loved the church, those Christian wives are seldom unhappy. No matter what their other circumstances might be, happiness is the inheritance of a Christian woman who's married to a Christian godly man. Do other women see such wives and like the queen of Sheba say, how happy you must be to have such a Christian husband, to be married to such a wise man who loves and lives so godly in Christ Jesus. Brothers, is it so? Wives, are your husbands similarly happy because they're married to you? Is that not to be the inheritance for any Christian man married to a Christian wife? Parents, are your children happy? Have you so ordered your family in Christ that your children grow up recognizing the joy that is found in following Christ? Seeing a love for Christ mediated and communicated through parents. I mean, we could go on and on and on, and, and we will throughout this summer series. We'll see to think this through in the various areas of life. To know what is behind that famous statement again made by C.S. Lewis. It is a Christian's duty, as you know, for everyone to be as happy as he can. Which he means, of course, happy through such ways as Psalm 36. By the way, that quote that we just read was written by a, in a letter by a man who had recently suffered the death of his dearly beloved wife while she was still a young woman. He's writing it to a man whose life similarly had just been devastated by the greatest conceivable loss. You see, such joy will even coexist with such sorrow. In fact, he, he describes it elsewhere in another quote in a different way. He says this, he says, God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God designed a human machine to run on himself. 
He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. That is why it's just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about religion. God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. You see, the problem with most human beings in human history is they've sought happiness in places destined to make them miserable. That's the reality we're living in. Or at least far less satisfied than anything like the joy we have in Christ. Now, of course, we know it is possible to be superficially happy with those fleeting pleasures of sin. Right? The author of Hebrews even mentions it's possibly superficially happy and wicked at the same time. But we can just see every day how fleeting and deceptive the world's happiness is at best. Uh, to have true happiness, you must come to the Lord and be in touch with the meaning of life and all the answers that he provides. The world does not have this, so it is doomed to look for what it can never find. Only Christ can provide such things. As St. Augustine famously asked, he said, were I to say, why have you become Christians? Every man will truly answer for the sake of happiness. We are Christians because of the sake of happiness. Uh, the psalm we read at the beginning reminds us again that God is the river. He's the fountain. He's the source of all joy, pleasure, you name it. And so as a conclusion, I'd like to give you a sort of a conclusion. That's one of those Baptist conclusions where there's much left to talk about. Um, but I wanted to, to get your attention. So, uh, no, two points on why this is so. I want to I finish with this just briefly. Uh, two points why God is so happy. We don't often think about God in those terms, do we? Certainly the world doesn't. But our God is an infinitely happy God. We know this from the scriptures. He's the source, the river of all pleasures. And so why is that the case? Why is God so happy? First, it's because God is happy simply because he delights in himself. God is happy because he delights in himself. There are so many examples of this throughout the scriptures, and we're going to examine some of those. But my mind immediately goes to the Lord Jesus' baptism. Matthew chapter 3, verses 17. What does the Lord say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Or the song of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 that says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. God delights in himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is on every page of the Lord's teaching. The Lord Jesus' life here on earth was lived in complete delight in his Father. In fact, in Ephesians 3, Paul gives us this kind of interesting word picture. He says, the father from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That's sort of a passing comment by the Apostle Paul, uh, noting that the whole reality, the whole concept we have of family and all that it means to us, how that is simply a reflection of God who made the world. You know that before happiness ever existed in the world, before the world even ever existed, happiness existed in God. Delight, pleasure, joy, as though you had thousands and thousands of close relatives who loved you with all your hearts and you loved in the exact same way. For example, my kids are never as happy as when they have their cousins with them. Ever as happy. Uh, they could stay at their cousin's house forever. They, they really could. They could spend all the time they want with them. They just love that time with their cousins. It's the sweetest time for them. If you could just multiply that a thousand times over, take all the happiness experiences of your lives, multiply the joy you have best known in this world, it would not be a drop in the ocean of God's delight. It would not be a millisecond of the blessed life of God before the world began. Do you see God in that way? I mean, think about it. The first time you've held your child in your arms, right? And, and that one you've loved in the womb for so long is here and, and is living. And he, is, um, he or she is instantly part of your family. Is there nothing more than pure delight than that? And yet it's not a drop 
in the ocean of what we know God to be. What he has been for all eternity. That's a wonderful thing. Understand this. God has never lacked anything in himself in any way. God has never been lonely. If you ever hear somebody saying that God made man because he was lonely, that's heresy. No way. God was not lonely. If we say to live is Christ, therefore, if he is our desire, if our hearts find our rest in him, how much more true is that within the Godhead? If we enjoy fullness in Christ, how much more the persons of the Trinity in each other? See, this is the blessedness of God. God is full of joy. He's full of happiness, delight, pleasure. And not only is he free from frustration and anxiety, but he has infinite peace, fulfillment, love, and joy in himself. Just as souls in this world and in love can find satisfaction in each other, minuscule in comparison, the infinite God is perfectly united in one glorious being. Each person, Father, Son, and Spirit, has shared this love, rivers of pleasure, light, and love between the members of the Godhead. Each one of the members of the Godhead has given and received this love. This is what our God is like. And here's the beauty. You and I are purchased into that love. It has been cured out into our hearts. Therefore, we have the joy of our love, and He is the source of that joy. We have something to offer a world that is full of bitterness and hatred. We have a personal relationship, communion into which we are all invited to an eternity of bliss. Rivers of pleasures. Or as the book says, God is uppermost in his own affections. Listen to this. God would be unrighteous as we would if he valued anything more than what is otherwise supreme value. So within the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it has been uppermost, God has been uppermost in his own affections for all eternity. So immediately we hear that and say, well, does that mean that God is self-centered then? Well, certainly not in the negative sense that we would use it. Why? Because we know he is a God of love. He's overflowing and outgoing in his created people who can be filled with such Love. We are invited into that communion of joy, that relationship of joy. We know that love does not seek its own. But it is only right that eternal Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would have within himself and for himself the first and infinite love. So again, as Piper puts it in the book, he says, God is the one being in all the universe for whom seeking his own praise is ultimately a loving act. When he does all things for the praise of his glory, he preserves for us and offers to us the only thing in the world that can satisfy our longings. God is for us, and the foundation of love is that God has been and is now and always will be for himself. That's a good thing. The foundation of all delight is in God himself. But because God delights in himself, secondly... We know that God is a happy God. And why is he a happy God? It's because God delights in his works. God delights in himself and God delights in his works. Who he is and what he does. He is happy in other words because he is sovereign. Psalm 115 verse 3, a verse we love. Our God is in the heavens and guess what? He does whatever he pleases. He has the right and the power to do whatever makes him happy, and he does. Our God is in the heavens. It means he is subject to no one. He is Lord over all. Daniel 4, 35 says, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He, God, does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? See, there's no frustration in God. There's no thwarting of his will. You know, we we say this. We say only if we were different and things were different, then we could be happier. God doesn't have that problem. Well, you say, what about evil? Well, of course, there's much more on that to come. But I will say this. We know God has no delight in iniquity. You know that, right? 
For example, when God the Father saw the agony of his beloved son and the wickedness that brought it to pass on the cross, he did not delight in those things in themselves because they were sin, right? With your wicked hands, you have done this, says Peter. Sin and suffering of the innocent are abhorrent to God. But there is something else we can say, isn't there? You remember how we said earlier that seeking the greatest happiness often requires loss? Well, in a similar way, God the Father decided that it was fitting for the author of our salvation to be perfected through sufferings. And so, in the view of eternity, it was the way to demonstrate his righteousness, that he might be just and justifier of him that believes in Jesus. So, therefore, when we come to Isaiah chapter 53, we read these incredibly shocking words in verses 4 and 10. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Yet... It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. The death of his son pleased the Lord to bruise him? You see, while it's true, sin and wickedness his soul hates, when you see the big picture, as Isaiah 53 lays out, bringing many sons to glory, we see that it has pleased the Lord to bruise his son. So even, listen to me, even the most wicked things in history, when God, who's the only one who's able to do this, surveys them from beginning to end while not partaking in the wickedness of the actions, while not delighting in any iniquity, while being pure, he is able to rejoice in all his works and all that he does and sees. So therefore, nothing in the world can frustrate the happiness of God. God is happy in who he is and in what he does. And here's the beauty. When we gain him, we glorify him. We therefore have everything. We share in who he is and what he does, which is the greatest of all happiness. Every other pursuit in life, graduates, listen to me. Every other pursuit in life is living for something far less than something, second best, is living for something less satisfying and unworthy. God has given us the capacity to delight, enjoy, savor, to find fulfillment and satisfaction ultimately in him. We know we love because he first loved us, right? God has thoroughly intertwined his glory in our joy. We cannot seek glory or joy from God without having it being the same thing. Our greatest love, our greatest joy, our full purpose, our greatest satisfaction, it must be found in the Lord. So therefore, we could merely conclude to say that it is a truly great thing to become a Christian. It is the greatest change that we could ever imagine that our love for him should come to exceed all the greatest loves and loyalties in our life. That our delight in him should grow and overshadow every other delight in this world. We're going to speak more on that next week. It's what we call conversion. To be a disciple, to have faith in Jesus, is to have such a change come upon us, even to lose our life for his sake and to gain him. There is something in following him that we find and receive that is far more precious than life itself. Now, obviously, we know we are not yet what we wish to be. Amen? Many lesser desires are far too close and too sweet to us at this point. But if you're a Christian, if you're truly a converted believer in Christ, you ought to have now a longing and an aspiration to be extravagant in your search for happiness in God. To have your love and your devotion fully in Him. Because ultimately, He is worthy of it. So let me just encourage you. If you call yourself to be a Christian, do you see God in this light? Do you see following him in this light in any way, shape, or form? Is joy even on your radar when you walk into this building to worship the King of Kings with your brothers and sisters? 
is pursuing and seeking your own joy the result of why you come Sunday morning. Why you live your life every day unto the glory of God. See, we've got to bring those things together. God doesn't just, when he saves you, right? He doesn't just capture your, 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 your mind and your soul. He doesn't just purchase simply your ticket into heaven. But he captures your heart and your desires. And though we know it's not perfect now, we know that that's a struggle often to desire him, to pursue him, to engage in joy in this life. Friends, for the true Christian, that is the lot. Ask yourself, when you are seeking joy, where do you seek it? Is it separate from glorifying God? If so, that's a problem. But friends, again, what a beauty it is to know that we're his. To know that ultimately if we're in Christ, not only is he gonna bring us into making us into his likeness, he's gonna continue that work, but he's gonna capture our desires too. He's gonna make it so our utmost desire is to worship him above all else. Amen. Would you stand as we pray together? Our Father in heaven, we confess, Father, that we, we have just too little sought your glory. We too much seek our own instead. Similarly, we, we've not delighted to you or in you according to your excellent greatness. Lord, you know our hearts. You know the hearts that have been converted and changed toward you have fully rejoiced in you. Or would you set us again on that single path to glorify your holy name and to fully enjoy you forever? Lord, I know in my own heart, I've been ashamed how I've forsaken that fountain of living waters. And in that, how we struggle to neglect so great a salvation that we've received from your loving hand. Father, that we who have been called by your name have so little enjoyed the very God who made us and spared not his only son, but gave him up for us all. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for our dullness. Forgive us for our slowness of heart. Take away our lukewarmness by your Holy Spirit and grant that we might live for that single purpose, which is our glory and our delight in you because they are the same thing. To you be the glory now and forever we pray. Amen.